the Sunda megathrust is ready to rupture. And scientists fear the next megaquake has already started with warning signs that mirror the deadly 2004 Indian Ocean disaster that killed 230,000 people in minutes. Picture a massive crack in the ocean floor, stretching 3,400 miles beneath Southeast Asia, where two giant pieces of Earth's crust have been locked in a deadly wrestling match for decades. This isn't just any fault line. This is the monster that unleashed the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, and now it's showing the exact same warning signs that preceded that catastrophe. Seismic stations across Indonesia are recording unusual earthquake swarms. GPS measurements show the seafloor is bulging upward, and deep ocean sensors detect pressure changes that suggest massive stress is building along the fault. But here's what's terrifying experts. The current activity is concentrated in segments that didn't rupture in 2004, meaning they've been storing energy for over 20 years. The math is brutal. When this fault finally snaps, it could generate a magnitude 9.0 or greater earthquake and a tsunami that would dwarf the 2004 disaster. Coastal cities from Thailand to Sri Lanka would have less than two hours before walls of water arrive. Are we watching the countdown to the Indian Ocean's next mega disaster? And is there any way to stop what's already begun? Beneath the Indian Ocean, the Sunda megathrust is where two colossal tectonic plates meet in a slow, relentless collision. The Indo-Australian plate pushes northeast, sliding beneath the vast Eurasian plate at a rate of 50 to 70 millimeters per year, a distance roughly equal to the width of a fingernail multiplied across hundreds of miles. Over decades, this steady motion forces the seafloor to crumple and warp, trapping energy in a silent struggle that no human can hear or see. The plates do not glide smoothly past each other. Instead, they lock together along segments called locked patches. Here, friction holds the plates immobile, even as the deeper rocks continue to creep. The result is a mounting strain, like a steel spring wound tighter and tighter with each passing year. This slow motion disaster is not just about horizontal movement. The real danger lies in what happens vertically. As the plates grind and jam, the leading edge of the Eurasian plate is forced upward, creating a bulge on the seafloor. Vertical uplift is the engine behind the world's deadliest tsunamis. When the fault finally gives way, the locked patch snaps free. The uplifted seafloor drops or rises in an instant. In 2004, sections of the ocean floor surged upward by as much as 10 meters in seconds, displacing billions of tons of water and sending waves racing toward shorelines at jetliner speeds. The Sunda megathrust's unique geometry makes it exceptionally efficient at turning this stored strain into vertical displacement. Unlike faults that slip mostly sideways, the Sunda interface is angled so that when it ruptures, it lifts the seafloor like a giant paddle. The result, a tsunami that can reach heights of 30 meters with almost no warning. Every year, the plates remain locked, more energy accumulates, and the potential for vertical movement grows. Scientists refer to this process as strain accumulation. It is the invisible countdown that underlies every major earthquake along this fault. Locked patches can store strain for centuries, then release it in a single catastrophic moment. The segments that did not rupture in 2004 have now been accumulating energy for over 190 years in some places. The mechanics are simple but unforgiving. The longer the plates remain stuck, the greater the eventual vertical shift and the more devastating the tsunami. The Sunda megathrust is not just a line on a map. It is a loaded spring wound by the steady march of the tectonic plates, waiting for the moment when friction gives way to fury. Centuries before satellites and seismic networks, the coral reefs off Sumatra quietly recorded the violence of the Sunda megathrust. Each time the fault ruptured, the land would lurch upward, leaving a signature in the growth rings of coral micro-atolls. These natural timekeepers captured a series of massive earthquakes between 1597 and 1703. 
a cluster of five ruptures in just over a hundred years. In the reefs near the Mentawai Islands, corals bear the scars, sudden jumps of half a meter, sometimes more, as the seabed heaved and then settled again. Scientists have dated these ancient upheavals using radiocarbon methods, piecing together a timeline of destruction that predates written records. The 1797 earthquake struck with force, lifting North Pagai and Cyberut Islands by more than a meter in a single convulsion. Colonial records describe a wall of water crashing into coastal towns, sweeping away ships and homes. The devastation was echoed in the coral, which stopped growing on one side and began anew at a higher level. Proof of the vertical leap. 36 years later, in 1833, the fault slipped again. This time, the uplift reached up to two meters along the West Sumatran coast. Government documents from the era detail entire villages erased by the tsunami, while sediment cores reveal thick bands of sand deposited far inland. Silent testimony to the reach of the waves. Despite these violent releases, the fault does not always reset fully. The southern Mentawai segment ruptured in 2007 and 2010, but these events only partially relieved the strain. Uplift measured just a fraction of earlier quakes, barely half a meter in places, leaving a dangerous slip deficit in the northern patch near Cyberut. The cycle of tension and release is uneven, with some segments waiting centuries, while others break in quick succession. In 2019, Professor Shri Widian Toro led a research vessel into the waters off Mentawai. His team deployed ocean bottom seismometers, hoping to map the locked segments beneath the waves. As data streamed in, a sudden drop in micro seismic rumbling caught their attention. Widian Toro stood on deck as the realization set in. This patch is poised for rupture on a scale rivaling 2004. The discovery triggered urgent calls to Indonesian monitoring agencies, who began tracking the segment with renewed vigilance. History, written in coral and sediment, now warns of a super cycle, centuries of quiet tension, punctuated by moments of unimaginable force. At a research station overlooking the Mentawai Islands, Professor Fauzan studies the latest GPS readouts. Each line of data traces the invisible rise of the seafloor in centimeters. The numbers are relentless. At Pagai Island, the land is lifting more than five centimeters each year. This is not a gentle swell. It is a bulge driven by decades of locked tectonic plates, a clear signal that the fault beneath is loading for something massive. Computer models fed by these measurements draw a stark picture. They show stress has reached levels not seen since before 1833, when the last great rupture swept this coast. The probability curves are unforgiving. According to the most recent forecasts, the window for the next major earthquake opens as soon as 2026 and stays wide until at least 2031. Within that span, the chance of a magnitude 8.8 .8 or greater event is no longer theoretical. It is a matter of when, not if. Professor Fauzan, a leading voice at Andalus University, does not mince words. We do not want this to happen, but the potential is real and we must anticipate it. For him, the numbers are not just academic. They are a countdown, ticking toward a disaster that could cost more than $1.25 billion in direct damage before even counting the loss of life. The models simulate not just shaking, but the vertical leap of the seafloor that would send a tsunami barreling toward the coast. The scenario is playing out in slow motion, confirmed by uplift rates, pressure changes, and a growing slip deficit in the Cyberroot segment. The urgency is sharpened by the fault's recent behavior. While the southern Mentawai patches slipped in 2007 and 2010, the northern segment remains locked accumulating strain at a pace that outstrips every other segment on the Sunda megathrust. Each year of quiet adds more fuel to the eventual rupture. The economic calculations are stark. A magnitude 8 or greater earthquake here would devastate Padang, paralyze ports, 
and cripple vital infrastructure across West Sumatra and beyond. Insurance models predict recovery costs that could exceed a billion dollars, with ripple effects on trade and livelihoods for years. But the greatest weight falls on the people living above this restless seam. For scientists like Fauzan, every new centimeter of uplift is a warning that cannot be ignored. The data do not lie. The clock is running, and the next section of the fault is already primed. As the numbers climb higher, so does the risk, not just for Sumatra, but for millions along the Indian Ocean Rim. Fajar was 11 when the ocean came for Banda Aceh. He remembers the sound, a roar that swallowed every other noise, then a wall of water that erased his home and his family in seconds. Now, two decades later, he sits in a small apartment lit by the blue glow of a laptop, lines of code scrolling across the screen. For Fajar, survival is not just memory, it is a mission. He builds an open source tsunami alert app, determined to close the gaps that failed him and so many others. The numbers are stark. In 2024, only about 40% of coastal villages from Aceh to West Sumatra have working, regularly tested local alert systems. That leaves millions exposed, families whose only warning might be the distant crash of waves. Fajar's app pushes notifications to thousands of phones, but even he admits the limits. He says that coding is his way to warn the world. What happened to Aceh can happen anywhere in minutes. Uptake rates for digital alerts rarely exceed one-third of residents in at-risk zones. In many places, sirens are rusted silent, and cell service flickers on and off with the storms. The human cost of these failures is measured in lives that could have been saved. After the 2004 tsunami, United Nations reports estimated that up to 15,000 people in Sri Lanka alone might have survived if a reliable warning system had reached them in time. The tragedy was not just the wave, it was the silence that came before it. In the years since, international aid has brought new towers and training drills, but the coverage remains uneven. In some towns, evacuation plans are rehearsed every month. In others, children have never heard a siren test. Fajar is haunted by the knowledge that disaster can strike without mercy, but also by the hope that technology, community, and memory can change the outcome. At a recent summit of disaster engineers, he said that we must code for the dead so the living may survive. His story is not unique. Across the Indian Ocean, survivors have become advocates, teachers, and innovators. But for every Fajar, there are thousands more living in the crosshairs, waiting for a warning that may never come. The risk is not just theoretical. It is personal, immediate, and written in the faces of those who remember what the ocean can take away. At the headquarters of Indonesia's Meteorology, Climatology, and Geophysics Agency, BMKG, a thick folder of internal documents sits locked in a cabinet. Inside are the minutes from a tense May 2020 meeting, where the fate of the nation's tsunami warning system was debated behind closed doors. The numbers on the page are blunt. A dozen ocean buoys, meant to detect the first hint of a tsunami, had failed or drifted out of service. Some had been vandalized or lost to storms, others simply left untended as budgets shrank. Scientists pleaded for urgent repairs, warning that the gaps left millions of people exposed. Decision makers hesitated, citing costs and procurement delays. A senior BMKG analyst warned that awaiting another disaster before fixing the buoys is not an option. We risk repeating 2004. Yet the repairs were postponed, with some officials arguing that funds should be held back until after a major event, gambling with lives to balance the books. The warning system's problems run deeper than broken machinery. In the same folder, a series of emails reveals a second battle, this one over information. As new strain meter data arrive from the Sunda Trench, showing mounting stress along the fault, outside commercial interests began to circle. Multinational mining and oil companies, holding lucrative extraction licenses near the trench, pressed for restrictions on public release of seismic data. Their argument was simple. Too much transparency could spook investors or disrupt ongoing exploration. 
the pressure worked. In several cases, the release of key seabed findings was delayed or redacted, leaving coastal communities in the dark about the true scale of the threat beneath their feet. For the scientists and engineers tasked with protecting the public, these obstacles feel like sabotage. The technology exists to give precious minutes of warning, but bureaucracy and commercial lobbying keep the system hobbled. The result is a deadly paradox. The world's most dangerous fault is monitored by a patchwork network that can fall silent at the worst possible moment. The documents from BMKG are not just a record of missed opportunities. They are a warning that without accountability, the next disaster will not be a surprise. It will be a failure foretold. The story the data tells is both urgent and incomplete. Publicly available seismic and geodetic records from Sumatra to Java show a clear pattern. Steady, relentless accumulation of strain along the Sunda megathrust, but no evidence that a rupture has already begun. GPS stations onshore measure the land inching upward and westward year after year, confirming that the fault remains locked and loaded. Offshore, deep ocean pressure sensors and campaign-based GPS acoustic readings track the slow rise of the seafloor, yet none have registered the abrupt, step-like displacements that would signal a propagating megaquake. Instead, the numbers fit the classic interseismic pattern, energy building quietly, the system primed but still holding. Yet beneath this surface of certainty, there are blind spots. The most dangerous stretches of the megathrust, especially south of Java and beneath the remote Mentawai Islands, remain under-instrumented. Sparse offshore geodetic coverage leaves critical gaps in our ability to detect subtle slip or slow rupture. The latest campaign datasets from 2023 and 2024 have yet to be fully released, leaving scientists waiting for answers that could change the risk calculus overnight. Seismic catalogs, while dense for onshore events, thin out beneath the deep trench, where small foreshocks or slow slip could go unnoticed. These are not just technicalities. They are the cracks through which disaster can slip unseen. In the face of these uncertainties, three priorities stand out. First, expand the offshore sensor network, especially in the Cyberut and Java segments, to catch any early signs of rupture. Second, push for real-time public release of all seismic and geodetic data, cutting through bureaucratic and commercial barriers that keep communities in the dark. Third, invest in high-frequency, cross-validated monitoring, combining GPS, ocean bottom pressure, and microseismic arrays to close the data gaps before the next crisis begins. The science is clear. While the Sunda megathrust is wound tight and overdue, there is no sign that the earthquake has started. The countdown continues, measured in centimeters and seconds, with millions depending on what we see and what we still cannot see. Right now, over 200 million people live within tsunami reach of the Sunda megathrust. With each tremor and swelling tide, the clock inches forward. Preparedness is the only defense. Science can pinpoint risk, but only action saves lives. The Earth does not warn twice. When the fault finally breaks, only what we do today will stand between survival and catastrophe.